There we go. All right, good afternoon, guys. We're here for our second Q&A session. Um, and we're gonna talk about pregnancy, genetics, ICDs, and wrap it up with exercise, because I know there's lots of questions about exercise. All right, so Brittany, let's um, talk about pregnancy real quick. So Christina Hago could not join us, but she was kind enough to go ahead and answer some questions for us, which I've posted in the chat. But in general, I would just like for you to comment on how we manage our pregnancies here. Yeah. Um, so there's kind of three main groups of um, pregnant women um, that we manage. So we manage those who are just uh, gene positive and have no disease and or ARVC patients with obvious disease but are stable um, uh, with right ventricular disease. These patients, um, we have a fair amount of data from our group and the um, the Norwegian group, for a minute, I forgot where they were, the Norwegian group um, that, that uh, pregnancy is safe, not associated with progression, patients do really well, especially if they stay on their beta blocker. We have a, a screening protocol that we recommend baseline evaluation to make sure you still fit in that stable category. Um, and then we do a repeat evaluation at seven months pregnancy, um, especially with whole term monitoring to make a plan for delivery. Um, again, if you fall into this group, um, your delivery, as long as you're stable, is as indicated obstetrically. So there's no reason, as long as you're stable, meet all those criteria to have a C-section just because you have ARVC. We do, if you have ARVC, tend to re recommend maternal heart monitoring um, during labor in addition to fetal heart monitoring. And then very importantly, because um, post-pregnancy, there's this huge hormone washout. And we've heard so much from all of our colleagues today about hormones um, that, that we do recommend another evaluation three months postpartum to make sure everything's kind of returned to normal and things are stabilized. So that's group one. Group two are those with quite severe RV disease, so almost RV failure. Um, and unfortunately, this is the group we have the least amount of data about. Um, we're still really trying to figure out um, if you have a completely normal LV, but a very, very bad RV, um, if pregnancy is gonna push you over the edge. This is a more complicated discussion about risks, benefits, monitoring, we're probably going to be monitoring you much more aggressively, things like that. And the people who fall into this category, we're happy to discuss this with in more detail. It's it's a big discussion of pros and cons. Patients who have LV disease, so either biventricular or um, ALVC, um, in our group, you know, this is really where we have a lot of data on from our heart failure colleagues because left ventricular cardiomyopathy is common in the general population. Um, so we have a lot of data on this that we can discuss pros and cons. Um, this group uh, does tend to drop their EF a little bit with pregnancy and it may not recover. So that is a discussion that you need to have with your doctor about you know, if you have LV disease, pregnancy truly may um, exacerbate your disease. And we have data on that. And maybe um, Dr. Elliott can comment on that a little further as well. But um, those are kind of the three main groups we're dealing with. Does that cover everything, Crystal? Yeah, I think so. And and Perry, did you have any comment about pregnancy um, with LV cardiomyopathy? Yeah, I, I not much to add. I mean, I think one of the key things is preconception counseling. Um, I think it's often not, it's often missed out of, of all the other advice and discussions that we have with patients. And I think it, it, it should be up front you know, when we're talking to, to young women who may want to have kids in the future. So it's, it's much better to deal with these things before they happen rather than, than after. Um, I think if you have LV disease, again, I think uh, women need to be aware that if they're on ACE inhibitors and so on, that's a potential risk to the to the fetus, to, to its kidney function. So again, if we've got someone with dilated cardiomyopathy or LV impairment, um, we'll often if sort of have a phase of maybe six months where we reduce or even stop the ACE inhibitor, monitor the LV function. If the LV function remains stable, um, then have a discussion about conceiving and going through the pregnancy. 
um, the, the, the most important drugs are the beta blockers. You know, it's beta block, beta block, beta block. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I, mean, I mean, they're 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 safe um, and they're they're effective, and they're probably one of the major reasons why most women with a cardiomyopathy can go through a successful pregnancy. So beta blockers are, are really important. But but it's that I would just emphasize that planning up in advance. That's the most important thing. Absolutely. Um, all right. So for our EPs, maybe we, you can help address some of these questions. So how, and people might be confused about the SICD. So how robust is the SICD? I've heard the wires falling through, even though they're, I'm not sure what wires they're talking about, but things like yoga and long arm movements. So I guess if you can comment, maybe talk about transvenous devices and those types of movements and then um, the SICD. Who, what types of patients do you recommend those for? So I'll just comment on, on that. I mean, if someone has advanced disease or presented with sustained VT and it's for secondary prevention, we generally air, you know, would recommend endocardial device because you can terminate the VT with antitachycardia pacing. And those individuals have more severe disease with lower signals to detect. So oversensing and, and misfiring is, it would be higher risk with a sub-Q device. So for secondary prevention and severe disease, st a standard defibrillator, one lead only, we would recommend. Where are the sub-Q ICD, I think is really great is for primary prevention, uh, particularly in young people. And, and what we've learned is, you know, it's equally effective in terms of preventing sudden death. You know, there's a higher rate of inappropriate shock. So the key is when you get screened for implant, there's certain there's three different ECGs as sort of a simulator to see what the signals that device will see. If the signals are really robust and, and it clearly meets criteria, I think you're going to be fine. If the signals are borderline or don't meet, you certainly don't want to put a sub-Q in that situation. I mean, as the disease progresses, the signals shrink in size, particularly for the phospholamban, but for all of ARVC. So it's, again, earlier disease, primary prevention. But I've been amazed that we've had some, you know, you know Brittany can comment, you know, teenagers, very slender, you know, young men and women, uh, girls and boys who get a sub-Q ICD that are just do it beautifully. And uh, he saves them having that lead put in their in their heart which has long-term risks of, you know, the lead fracturing or infection or whatever, but uh, Harry or Brittany or anyone could comment. Yeah, I just want to add to that. I think it's it's all case by case basis. If you really, as Hugh Moy pointed out, if it's really primary prevention and and uh, no documented arrhythmia, so we'll all be worried about the sudden death risk, then sub QICD makes a whole lot of sense. Uh, but as, you know, we have older people presenting with, monomorphic VT, which can easily be patient dominated, it makes a lot of sense to actually have a, a, a lead in. So it's all case by case basis. And clearly sub QICD has a great role to play in this young, young, young individuals who present with just a sudden death risk, but never had documented arrhythmias. Yeah, so there's a specific question from someone who says they have an SICD, they've had three shocks in the past year for VT, would they benefit from an ICD with pacing? And obviously it's case by case, but but what is the threshold? Like how many shocks per year is acceptable? And at what point do you start talking about medications, pacing, catheter ablation, Harry? Well, I, would, I would think, Harry, that I would send them to you to get inflation done. <laughs> I think shocks are not acceptable. Zero so shocks. There's no shocks that are acceptable. And I keep telling this to patients, it is not about the heart. It's about it, the shock completely damage your, your quality of life. Um, it's all about it, it really is the managing your head more than the heart at that point. Um, I think the, the, it's almost like an insurance policy. You have the defibrillator, but never, ever have to use it. And if you have to use it, then you have to use other methods of preventing the arrhythmias from coming through either by means of catheter ablation, antiarrhythmics, or even antitachycardia pacing. But just to be very clear, no shocks are, 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 are there's not even one shock. I think shocks should not happen. Agreed. All right, so we have some genetics questions and I think here we really just need some clarification. If only, this is the question, if only 50% of ARVC patients are gene positive, why would family members who test negative be released from lifelong surveillance? So I, I think people are getting confused within a family if family members test negative with a known um, mutation, 
what are the recommendations? So Jody, if you want to talk from your perspective um, in Australia. Yes, just looking for the mute button. <laughs> um, good. Yeah, okay. So I'm not 100% sure I've understood the question correctly, but if somebody, I mean, if you're lucky enough in your family to have a genetic cause that we feel really confident in, and not everyone does, um, because there's still a lot that we don't understand about genetics, but if we do understand the particular change in your family and are really certain about it, we can use that as, that as a tool to test for the presence or absence of that particular variant in other family members. And if you test positive for that, so if you do have that particular change, then it doesn't mean that you'll ever get the cardiomyopathy, but we need to keep checking you on a semi-regular basis. And it depends on lots of different things, but maybe every couple of years you would need to come and see a cardiologist. Um, whereas if you don't have that, then um, that particular variant, you're negative for that, then you can be released. Um, generally in Australia, we only really release people if we've done at least one clinical evaluation. So one checkup with a cardiologist so that we can make sure that everything aligns and makes sense because sometimes things don't and you want to catch that. Um, but I think the more we learn, the more confident we are getting in some of these particular genetic changes as well. Yeah, that's good. I just wanted to clarify that for the people listening because I think the, the person was confused about within a family with a known um, mutation identified. Um, and Cindy, I'm going to see if you can address this. Has there been any recent research on prevalence of developing ARVC with one who has uh, one recessive gene? And I know we have one particular family um, and to our knowledge, no one has developed ARVC with the recessive form. But so I think that's a really tricky question because some of the variants we know are autosomal dominant. Some of the variants, there's a couple variants in ARVC that truly follow an autosomal recessive pattern. So you inherit one from each parent. And if you only have one of them, you're, you know, really not at risk. You're a carrier. But in real life, a lot of the variants fall in between. So you can inherit variants of different levels of risk for each so to answer the question, in those rare cases where we truly have autosomal recessive, you're right to our to what we're aware of. No, none of those folks have developed full on ARVC, but I think that situation is extremely rare. More often, we have um, a gene that's really autosomal dominant, or there are you know an autosomal dominant and then a modifier. Um, so true autosomal recessive ARVC is extremely rare. Um, I don't know, I've got lots of genetics colleagues. Do you guys agree, disagree, comments to add? Agreed, everyone's thumbs up. <laughs> All right. So, okay, so let's talk about um, some LV cardiomyop uh, cardiomyopathy. So people wanna know, is it better prognosis for left-sided or right-sided? We'll start with Perry or Hugh. <laughs> Oh, he unmuted first. Go. No, it's Perry. <laughs> I was going to nominate Perry. <laughs> so, so like everything in life, it depends. So yeah. I, I, I don't, it's not so much which ventricles affected. It's it's really the underlying cause. So um, I, I think that the reason that we are so attuned to to this left to left sided disease is because I think the genetic architecture of that is is now being unravelled at pace. Um, and when we see these ring-like scars, or some of the scars that Andre described in his athletes, actually, um, we've got a list of about four or five genes that we worry about. Um, and often, actually, with relatively mild impairment of LV function. So I think, actually, oh, it's tomorrow. Tomorrow, I think we've got a paper coming out in German Cardiology sort of describing the, the fill again, the filament C variant, for example. Filament C, we see increasing amounts of, and it's a nasty one. So, yeah, they get a lot of arrhythmia, they drop dead suddenly, um, but they can do that with an ejection fraction of 45%. So, so there's the standard sort of general cardiology paradigm that don't worry until your ejection fraction is less than 35% doesn't work in this space. You know, that the genet of all the diseases I deal with in the clinic, the genotype in DCM, LV disease, is the one that most profoundly impacts on my practice, I think. And then coming off of that, who has a better prognosis, gene elusive or gene positives? 
Depends. <laughs> For pure standard ARBC, I mean, we've had we've written papers with a thousand patients on that, um, and it you know if this is classic ARBC defined by the 2010 task force criteria and the usual desmosomal genes, as well as a true gene elusive patient. If you look at those survival curves from ventricular arrhythmias, those survival curves from heart failure, it's pretty much the same. The only difference is that a gene positive patient um, tends to develop the disease at a younger age. Not always the case, just, you know, if you take 500 patients and average them, it's an average five to six year earlier onset. Um, but the course looks Cindy, off you all in told, the aggregate. Cindy, can you comment on the effect of modifying exercise being more important and inclusive than in the gene positive? Yeah, and I think Andre actually summarized this really, really well during his talk, um, that there's certainly evidence in both gene positive and gene elusive cases that cutting back on your exercise is effective. Um, as Andre pointed out, those gene-elusive people are disproportionately these overwhelmingly high-level athletes. And it does look like cutting back on exercise is good for everyone, but at least from an arrhythmia perspective, we haven't tracked this from a heart failure perspective, but at least from an arrhythmia perspective, um, the gene-elusive patients seem to disproportionately benefit from really cutting back on exercise. Um, and then I don't know. So Andre, you understand the mechanisms of this far better than I do. Do you want to follow up on that? Does that make sense? Why? <laughs> I speculate on the mechanisms. Um, the, I mean, I was really pleased to see that data because anecdotally, that's what we've seen as well. And, and I actually use that as a motivator because I think in people that have been doing a lot of exercise, it's really helpful to know that in the short to medium term, that, they'll, that they serve to benefit the most from cutting back on exercise. And then, you know, it, sometimes we find then that it's possible to be a little bit more liberal with the exercise recommendations. But um, the only other little trap in that, again, anecdotally, I've found is that sometimes the changes in exercise, either up or down, can be a sort of irritable time. So just when people cut back on exercise, I don't think in the very, very short term, um, they should expect a big clinical difference, but but over over sort of months to years, it can it can really make make a big difference. And I think it's an important sort of motivator um, that if people cut back on exercise, they may well feel better and have fewer shocks, etc. Um, and 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 I think also you know looking into the long term, it's it's incredibly important. You know, less EP procedures, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And the mechanism, the mechanism, I don't know. I think it's uh, just the reverse of what it is that that seems to be contributing to the substrate to begin with. You know, less um, less stretch, um, less rub, less exacerbation of, of of the genetic, the underlying genetic uh, problems. And just to, also to Perry's point, one of the one of the athletes that I presented as an example of kind of this epicardial scar was was indeed a desmoflacan cardiomyopathy, and it was probably a little bit uh, cheeky to put that in with the um, with the rub concept because I think it is a bit different. But also in in non desmoflacan um, arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy in athletes, we we overwhelmingly see this epicardial pattern. It's really quite um, striking. Yeah, I mean this. It in, in our clinics, we see that in two, two scenarios, um, which overlap to an enormous degree. One is the genetic substrate. So, so desmosomal genes, desmoplakin in particular, desmoglein does it, filamin does to some extent. Um, but of course, the other disease which affects the epicardium is myocarditis. Yeah, that, yeah. That, that's the classic place for it. So I think, I think what you're seeing is myocarditis in your athletes, but, but what the, where the speculation is, is, is what, what the mechanism of that is, I think. Yeah, it's certainly one of the discussions we have every time because people want to know what's caused this, why them, and and certainly um, a degree of subclinical, you know, infection and myocarditis yeah. asked is one of the absolute possibilities. The other things, do you think some athletes? I mean, you know, if because of the nature of of what they do, they they carry on exercising even if they're feeling a bit crappy. So they've got a bit of a fever and they've got a viral infection, but they'll still go out and do that 10K run sort of thing, which is exactly what you shouldn't do if you've got myocarditis. <laughs> yeah, ab absolutely. The problem is when the alarm goes off at 5 a.m., um, everyone can find an excuse or a little bit of a tickle in the throat. So it's, it, there's always a grey zone. 
Um, uh, certainly when people have got a fever or an elevated heart rate, they, they definitely shouldn't be uh, exercising. Yeah. So let's talk about, because I don't know if this was explicitly stated, but what are the exercise recommendations for our ARBC patients and do they differ among those who are gene positive and gene elusive? Hugh, do you want to start? Well, I'll tell you what I tell patients, but then Andre will tell us the real answer because I always <laughs> quote him. I, you know, I tell him, you know, clearly no competitive endurance sports, so no competitive soccer, no you know triathlons, marathons, you know things like that. Uh, think on the other hand, things like golfing, golfing, walk, walking, you know, are fine. There's a nice figure in the arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy guidelines which Cindy put together showing the things that you should do, you are fine to do on a regular basis, and the things you should do rarely, if ever. And, and it has to do with both intensity and duration, at least in my mind. High intensity and duration is clearly terrible. High intensity, short duration, I guess, was probably fine if it's not, it's not very often, you know, you know, that kind of stuff. And then Andre, when he was visiting last time, he sort of, you know, gave us some encouragement that weight that, that type of exercise may be preferred. So like push-ups or sit-ups or pull-ups or whatever, maybe, or some white light weightlifting may be perfectly fine. But Andre, I'll turn it over to you. You're the world's expert. <laughs> um, yeah, and, and also to address the question of gene elusive or gene positive, um, I don't see a difference. Uh, I mean, the patients are often very interested in whether this might be um, exercise induced or gene elusive or, or gene positive. But as we heard, the prognosis is the same. The benefit from reducing exercise may be even more. Um, so I don't, I don't see that as making a difference at all. Uh, if anything, the, the gene elusive is even more so. Um, and then I'd agree really with what everything that, that Hugh said. And, and thanks to all of the data that's come, come out of Johns Hopkins, I think we have um, a clearer idea and that the, the evidence that um, restricting exercise to less than 150 minutes a week of mild to moderate exercise, the, the problem is that you need to be very specific on what constitutes moderate exercise because for a, for a professional cyclist, for example, their idea of moderate exercise is, is instead of 800 kilometres, it's 300 kilometres and instead of you know, redlining it up the hill, they just go, you know, so basically what's moderate for an elite athlete is the most extreme for someone else. So it really have to be quite specific. And I must admit, sometimes we do a um, cardiopulmonary exercise test to, to kind of define, show them what we sort of um, would, mm -hmm. would, you know, for the people who like to wear a heart rate monitor, we can set some guidelines. I, um, I don't do that very often because most people have, have a good idea. And then, uh, the, you know, we do use uh, weight training as, as a supplement because it, it, um, it does have, if it's done as sort of um, not as a sort of circuit training or, or um, you know, uh, we have F45 and, and CrossFit and things like that, which are very aerobic. But if, if it's just a gym program, it has very little impact on the things that we think. Um, are important in the in the causation. You know, it has very little increase in cardiac output and, and wall stress and things like that. And it gives people still some degree of control, and they can still feel good about uh, about their their fitness. Just Does one anyone... topic, though, Cindy, uh, we did a paper, Cindy. You know, maybe you can comment on this. That we initially thought that if you took anyone with a mutation and you did X amount of exercise, you're going to get these. And so we did this little study and we found that some patients with a mutation that exercise a whole heck of a lot seem to get away with it, you know, and, and don't get the disease. And, and it's like, what is the mysterious protective factor? But maybe you can comment, Cindy, on that study that you did and how, what you think it means. Sure, Hugh, that's um, a good point. And I will say that particularly for family members, the data is overwhelmingly from PKP2 variant carriers. So everything I say right now you know, if you're a carrier of a desmoplakin variant um, or a phospholamban variant, um, you know, that we don't really have data. The data I'm talking about now isn't really necessarily directly translatable. It might be, but it also might not be. So particularly for family members with PKP2 variants, we took, as Hugh's describing, I don't know, a little bit over 100 pure family members with PKP2 variants took their exercise histories. A lot of you all participated in these interviews, these very long conversations about what you've done since age 10. 
We scored them by intensity, duration. Um, and as Hugh said, what we found is um, up to about the AHA recommended exercise for healthy adults, which is what Andre just referenced, the 150 minutes of mild to moderate exercise, um, that it looks like that was sort of the safest level of exercise. Very few of those individuals um, developed ARVC, but I think maybe one did. Um, and I don't believe any developed a sustained ventricular arrhythmia, but again, maybe one did. Um, but after that, more than that, the risk increased. But as Hugh says, in that pure patient group, so individuals who came to us, just a family member, we, are, we excluded all the probands, you know, there are people sort of into their 60s who'd clearly been high level athletes and only about half the individuals, even at the highest level of exercise, you know, met the task force criteria, really had a diagnosis of ARVC. Uh, so the question is, why not? What else is going on? Um, for those of you who attended the Q&A last session with Peter Van Tentelen, uh, I'm a geneticist and genetic counselor by training. Um, based on these pedigrees, based on these family stories, based on data where we have from people who have genetic tests that are just in the general population, I think it's highly likely that in addition to the PKP2 gene plus exercise, there's a whole bunch of other genetic modifiers. Um, that are acting either in a way to give you more risk of disease or give you less risk of the disease. Um, hopefully the gene loss Dr. Van Tintelen was talking about earlier will help us figure that out, but that's that's my best guess. Um, be curious to hear what others think. Yeah, so for, for kids who are gene positive, no signs or symptoms, is it okay for these families to have them play high intensity sports like soccer? That's the big question many people are interested in. Um, can you define kid? <laughs> like, um, I would say um, between eight and 12 would, would be what they're asking about. Um, high in I think, again, it all depends on what high intensity soccer really is. Is there any huge risk at age eight, probably, of high intensity soccer? Perhaps not by age 12. Yeah, we know this disease can have adolescent onset. I would think by age 12, that's when you would start to consider um, really, a, you know, is this worthwhile? I will say that the guidelines are very, very clear for ARVC patients. For these at-risk family members, the guidelines are specifically, um, clinicians should counsel families that high intensity exercise and a gene positive ARVC family members associated with an increased risk. So I think these are very much family decisions, family conversations, family values, risks and benefits. Um, <laughs> yeah, they're hard. <laughs> yeah, they're hard. I, you know, yeah. I've got two teenagers, they're not athletes, but there is something also to be said, you know, your 12 year old is playing club soccer, high intensity soccer, building their social life that way. Right. Um, and I think that's, yeah, where that. we, we get concerned is that's who they're starting their their peer group with. Does it become high school sports and college sports? And, you know, um, it just snowballs from there. So it's just something to be mindful of. Um, and, and Crystal, one of the, just on that point, one of my colleagues from Belgium, a guy named Mark Gawillik, who, who um, is a, a pediatric cardiologist, he defines sort of puberty as a really important cutoff because before that kids play sport and it's more about play and when they get tired they stop um whereas once they and of course this isn't a set cutoff but once they hit puberty they mm -hmm. truly compete and i think that that is a difference because you know when it's when it is play it's really important in terms of psychological development a whole lot of things and probably probably less uh less important as a as something that's changing the substrate versus you know once kids hit and age, and it probably is around puberty, they truly start to, it's important that they beat their friend. And I think that's, that's a, a you know, important dotted line. Does, does anyone taking care of families, does anyone give the magical heart rate that people are supposed to stay under? And what is it? I'll, I'll, I'll just comment that I, we've never done that. I mean, one, all these patients are on beta blockers, which blunt your heart rate anyhow. And then saying that you, it's fine to exercise, keep your heart rate less than 110, 120, 130. I'm not aware of any data saying that that, you know, is some safe threshold or safe cutoff. So, you know, I, I think it's sort of, you know, I think it encourages people to try to push the limit and keep that heart rate, whatever. So I don't, 
I don't believe in it. I think, and beta blockers are important, which screws up any relationship between heart rate and how much exercise you're doing. But again, Andre, we'll turn it over to you. And uh, Perry, what do you think? Yeah, I, I never do it unless I do an exercise test to, to put some science around that um, because it, it's you're absolutely right. There's people who are who are told by others, you know, keep your heart rate to 120 and then you do the exercise test and demonstrate that they're almost maxing at that. And then and then, the you know, the corollary, you have people who who at 120 have just started walking. So if you're going to use a heart rate, well, the bottom line is just don't use it. But if if you're going to, then you have to do a cardiopulmonary exercise test and, and have some have some real rationale behind uh, setting a heart rate limit. And I would just add as well to our conversation from the first session about hypervigilance that um, uh, in our patients, we find the best way to raise your heart rate is to watch your heart rate. So um, to it's really it just gets into this mind game. And it really, if you watch it, I think your heart rate's going to be higher doing laundry, you know, than it is, uh, you know, going on a brisk walk. So we really clinically and in terms of your exercise intensity, do not find value in it. And in fact, it can be mis misleading and lead into this hypervigilance cycle. So um, that's one of the biggest things that I find um, Hugh and I are correcting from EPs around the, the US. I don't know how you guys feel in Australia or in the UK, but we are constantly correcting these heart rate limits that have been given that are nonsensical and based on no data. Not just heart rate. I, I tell people to throw away their Apple Watch and their blood pressure machine and everything because for that very reason. I mean, it's it's you know it's about it's about common sense. I mean, the, yeah, the the discussion about exercise is, is as everybody's. It takes a time. I mean, if you talk about the heart rate, it's a quick way of getting the patient out of your consulting room. But actually, to discuss you know, what exercise means for them, what their what their expectations are, what their level of training is, you know, it, it take, it's a long conversation that. Um, but it's about getting them to live with their disease and not to be obsess about their, their physiology. Yeah, Chris, any comment from I agree, down under? I agree. <laughs> I was just going to say, I agree with all the comments, but the problem is every patient has an Apple Watch or a Garmin or something <laughs> like that. So they're, they're looking at their heart rate anyway. Um, so I agree in principle about all the discussion, but the patients won't leave the room until you tell them a, 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 some sort of guide to a heart rate. So there's a lot of pressure to, to give them a, a heart rate of some description, but I agree with all the comments. Um, I, I mean, people just have every sort of monitor they have, so that hypervigilance issue, they, they're checking their heart rate anyway um, all, all the time. So it's a real problem. Mm -hmm. And Hari, I know you are notorious for telling people, just live your life, ignore it. <laughs> yeah, I, I, again, there is no magic number. And the more you tell them an arbitrary number, the more you're lying to yourself. You don't really know what, what you have to say. I keep telling them, especially that these questions come through patients who really don't have a lot of structural disease, have a genetic mutation, but are confused. They don't know what they can do, what they cannot do, and whatever. We're closely observing them year after year. We're doing whole monitors, we're doing echocardiography. So I tell them, what are you doing right now? Don't push it. Just keep doing what you're doing and we're going to monitor your heart. And if there's any change, I will advise you that you're doing too much. Um, so just and don't, don't, don't like escalate it. Don't, don't train for anything. But whatever you're doing, if you're comfortable with, if you can preserve your sanity, keep doing that and we'll work with you to get you there. That's the usual thing that I tell people. And Chris and, and Jody and, and some of the other genetic counselors, I just want to comment um, with the autopsy cases, the importance of um, obtaining those DNA samples and um, how you go about that and what's the time sensitivity nature of it. And do you automatically use it all and do all the genetic testing you can or are we waiting? Sort of what, what do you guys do? Well, this is, I'll start and Jody can correct me. Um, but, but basically, um, we've got a mandate in Australia and New Zealand that every young person who dies under the age of 40 must have a blood sample collected at post-mortem and stored. So that's something we established over a decade ago. And it's a really useful resource, not just for our VC, but for all genetic heart diseases. So there's a blood sample always available. We see the families usually within six to eight weeks after the death of their loved one. Um, and in our discussion about clinical evaluation, psychological support, et cetera, et cetera, we discussed the potential option of um, using that blood sample from postmortem to try and identify the genetic cause of disease. Uh, 
and it's whether they have a phenotype at postmortem or not. Um, so if they have ARVC at postmortem, it's helpful. If they have an unexplained postmortem, it may be helpful as well. And I alluded to that in my talk about concealed cardiomyopathies as one potential uh, cause of sudden death in young people. So we, we have a pretty rigorous program in Australia and New Zealand in, in terms of investigation. Um, but I'll hand over to Jody because um, there's the issue, of course, of the family's expectation that they think that this, this is going to be solved in every case. And, of course, the genetic testing pickup rate is quite low in sudden unexplained death in young people. So I'll hand over to Jody, but that, that's an introduction anyway. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the really lucky things in Australia is we often don't have this problem of trying to find DNA samples. And to be honest, after 10 years, we forget how lucky we, we are with that. But we're generally always having a conversation with our families about the option to do genetic testing and then how that should be done and what the expectations are. And I guess where there's been no cause found, you know, you really you're casting such a wide net. The chance of finding things that can confuse the situation is much, much higher. And the chance of finding something that we feel really certain about is really, I mean, realistically, it's very low. But when we find it, it's extremely helpful. So we should, you know, we say that we should do this sort of testing and, but you know, be guided as much by an expert group as possible to try and minimise any um, confusion and, and harms. So what genetic testing we do, that's a really difficult question as well because the DNA sample is precious. I mean, we're lucky because we've generally got one available, but it's not a huge amount of DNA and especially for children. And so we have to make a really careful decision. In Australia, we don't really have access to um, funded genetic testing easily. And so as a way around that, we've um, developed a research program through Chris's group where we do lots of exome or even genome sequencing in families. Um, and we're continuing to, you know, we see the families where there's been a young sudden death as being prime candidates for that kind of testing because I've got so many examples of people where we've come back after two, three, you know, four years. The, ge the gene would never have been on a clinical genetic panel and we've been able to solve them. And, you know, I think... It really says something for that as a as a way of doing testing where there's you know not much DNA. And a, and a great example is what Perry raised earlier: things like filament C, which we never would have even considered two three years ago, and FOD three and and all these other new genes. And um, so we, we've our standard approach has been doing an exome, do a virtual panel, and then come back to the exome data at any time in the future when new genes are discovered. Uh, we might we might supersede that soon with whole genomes, but we'll we'll see if we've got money to do it. I was going to say that, Chris, is it isn't the future to do a whole genome on rather than store the blood. I mean, just get 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 rid of these get, get rid of these freezers and put it in a database. You know? I think yeah. every genetic test there should only be one genetic test in five years' time. That's a whole genome. Yeah, for for, for everything. I think I think we're not far off that either. I think it's just the storage is part of the big issue. Um, and the cost is still a little bit prohibitive, but we're getting there. So, Jody, particularly in light of the international audience and the international panel, would you mind just mm. super briefly sharing um, the findings of yours and Lika's survey of the sort of the awareness broadly of these recommendations and the, basically the message? I think we all have a lot of work to do with our colleagues. Yeah, yeah. So, so we've just surveyed a whole bunch of healthcare professionals from all over the globe. Um, we actually managed to get fairly decent um, responses, but I guess the it seemed very clear that across the world there is huge incons inconsistency in the way that um, you know clinical evaluation of families, post mortem genetic testing, um, basically every aspect of care of families is really different and not even just between countries, but even within countries. So, you know, potentially patients, families attending in a city would get different um, advice and, and options compared to families attending in, in different areas in the same country. Um, and one of the issues was that, a lot, and this was one of the things I took away from the, the data set was that um, basically everyone thought that there were health inequalities um, in this whole process because the families that 
could navigate the system and ask the right questions were the ones who found their way through and got what they needed done and everyone else was a bit more left, you know, in the dark. And and I think even in Australia where, you know, I know we're fortunate to have, you know, a DNA sample and access to different types of, you know, really good genetic testing, it definitely happens here as well. So I think that's a big issue for all of us to consider is how we make these um, options more equitable in whatever setting we exist in. Mm-hmm. And Perry, I'm hoping to get your input. Um, you know, someone's asking about the differences in presentation in terms of RV cardiomyopathy versus LV cardiomyopathy. And we know with LV, we see more myocarditis like presentation with troponin leaks and chest pain. Um, do you see a lot of chest pain and how are you treating that? we have not have much luck here. Um, I think there's probably two broad types of chest pain. So I think a lot of patients with, with dietary cardiomyopathy, LV disease, get it's, it's an angina like pain, but it, it's not always precipitated by exercise. It often lingers for several hours. Um, a bit like the heart rate discussion we had, we sit there and, and, I, and I say to them, look, I could, make, I could make up an explanation for your pain, mm-hmm. but I really don't know what's causing it. Um, and then we talk about how they might manage it. And, and it actually usually comes and goes and often resolves. Um, but then you've got the, like the hot phase pain, which is myocarditis. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I mean, it's, it always it always amuses me actually when we, we sit. How, I mean, how many years have we been talking about hot phases, guys? You know, <laughs> you know, hot fa- this hot, this incredible hot phase. You know, with troponin rise and arrhythmia, and and the one word we didn't use was myocarditis. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah, it's, it's, it's always it's always been there. It's classic myocarditis, um, and that's I think that's desmoplakin is particularly prone to that. I think. Um, Sometimes no obvious precipitant, but I think exercise can do it. I think emotional stress can do it. Um, we see it f- in f- as a familial phenomenon. So, you know, we have families with familial myocarditis who actually turn out to be desmoplakin. Um, and actually, you know, we're now starting to test our acute myocarditis patients. And what do you know? As, uh, quite a few of them have got desmoplakin mutations. So that's, that's what I was alluding to in, in my comment to Andre earlier. There's this, there's this massive overlap between myocarditis and, and desmoplakin disease. Um, but um, the, so I think it depends on the type of the chest pain. With, with the myocarditis presentation, it's a really interesting dilemma. So if, if here we are at an ARVC meeting. So we look, at, we look at that presentation through an ARVC prism and we, we don't think about immunosuppression, we think about arrhythmia risk of disease progression and should I be putting the ICD in? But if, you, if you're coming from I don't know, Pavia or Padua, and the patient presents that way. Well, this is acute myocarditis. We biopsy the patient. If they've got lymphocytes and no virus, we must immunosuppress them. But it's exactly the same presentation. And and the paradigms are totally different, but it's the same disease. And it's it's an interesting dilemma. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, So we're going to end with a COVID question because you thought you were going to be off the hook. Oh, geez, come on. (laughs) It's, it's so, early in Australia and it's late in the UK. Do we really have to? <laughs> it's just one. So, I mean, it's, it's a question where ARBC patients who are fully vaccinated, do they still need to take their precautions? Because now we're lifting mask mandates and, and whatnot. Um, what are your thoughts? In the UK, I'd, I'd yes. Say, yeah, 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 I would say, yeah, for yeah, the yeah, moment, yeah. yeah. Yeah, because it's, I mean, I think it, and the UK, things are looking pretty good at the moment with vaccination, but new variants, it's not 100% protection. You know, we made a lot of mistakes last year by thinking we defeated the virus just simply by shutting the doors and closing the windows. You know, so I think, you know, I think slowly, slowly, we have to wait and see. So I think if uh, it's follow, I follow national guidance. I hate to say, but we agree with the UK people as well. <laughs> well, you've been more successful than we have. But. <laughs> it's because we're, not, it's like, because we're, we're an island at the end of the world. So no one <laughs> and like everything with COVID, the answer we give this week may be different from the answer we give in That's four right. weeks. Exactly. <laughs> Exactly. Hey, it could like, be worse, guys. It could be in New Zealand. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> uh, we, we don't mind the people from the from New Zealand. <laughs> well, thank you, everyone. Hugh, do you want to go ahead and give some closing remarks? 
we'll just so, do it uh, here. So I wanted to thank uh, all of the fabulous speakers, 15 wonderful speakers from all over the world that heeded our call to, to uh, step up in this time of COVID, deliver an international virtual ARVC symposium. And I think it's been probably the best one ever. We missed the collegiality and the sociability and the sidebar conversations and so forth. But boy, the science and the, the, the involvement from all over the world has been extraordinarily exciting. I've watched, listened to every lecture and they've been really superb. So I want to thank everyone for contributing. I know all of you donated your time and effort and we're not compensated and and uh but i think we're all committed to the patients and families we deal with i particularly want to thank the hopkins arvc group uh Brittany, crystal and uh cindy but but really crystal has become is just done a fabulous job putting this whole thing on you know Hoover and all these new concepts and approaches i think it turned out great so uh crystal thank you very much uh, well done and uh, this is a, a memory for all of us Yes, thank you, everyone. This will be the only seminar that uh, ever stayed on time and will end on time. <laughs> um, but thank you, everyone. I um, hope everyone enjoyed it. And we'll get those talks posted uh, soon. Have a good night. Have a good morning. Have a good rest of your day. Bye, guys. Thank you, Bye. everyone. Stay safe. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks a lot. Bye.